Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimp with a Limp and I'm here with a bittersweet video for you all. This one is going to be my last one for a more fearful sacrifice by Flying Pig Game, uh, by Flying Pig Games rather. Uh, it's been on my table for a while and I've got to say I have enjoyed the hell out of this one. I went ahead and played a little bit off camera uh, to get a little farther into the game because I wanted to show you guys kind of a little more how it played out. Had some interesting events, some pushes, some pushbacks. It was kind of going both ways, but I wanted to kind of get into the, the final thoughts of everything. First off, components wise, components are obviously excellent. Biggest one being the map itself. The map is just huge. Okay. I have been using half of what's available for this game. The, and it takes up a huge amount of space. All right, so it's, it's for what you would consider an average war game map, right? This is the whole thing completely laid out is about four times the size of that. So there's just so much play area. And of course the map itself is gorgeous because it's hand drawn. Definitely got a pan back here, let you guys look at Gettysburg a little bit right here, the, the center of the conflict of itself. Now, for me to be saying all this lovely stuff about a Civil War game says a lot because I'm not a Civil War enthusiast. I've never really been big into Civil War games, but I like the mechanics behind this game. I really like how the game functions itself. Anyway, on to the rest of the components. Everything else, good. Like I said, the map itself is the, the key. It's the best aspect of the game. Uh, counters are great. They're all nice and thick. I already addressed a lot of this earlier, but just to say it again, uh, the components themselves are fantastic. The only drawback that you're going to have when it comes to components, uh, the issue with the player aids, which I addressed earlier, but they are doing an update kit for that. So that's already going to be rectified with the second edition. So if you didn't get the first edition, the second edition will take care of that. So you won't have that problem. And uh, they are going to make that available for people who have the first edition as well. One key thing is this game is a huge table hog. You have to have a massive amount of space. If you're a war gamer, you're probably already used to having to have a massive amount of space just to you know get everything across the table. Uh, but if you really want to feel this game, do a, a campaign, do the whole three days, have the whole map out there and really just play it out. Uh, you got to have a spot where you can have a good sized table. I'm talking like six by four at minimum uh, to get all the map out and then player aids and all those components. When you get it all laid out, uh, it takes up a fair amount of space. Now, before I get into what I really thrived with on this game, I kind of want to show you guys where I had played up to because I had played up into the 12th hour. So we started at uh, 9 a.m., uh, yeah, I think this one started at 9 a.m. Anyway, so it's 9, 10, 11, 12. And each time more units were coming onto the board, more core cards, more division cards, all that cool stuff. I want to show you guys how the push ultimately played out. Now, up here where the main fighting was going on, I really do believe that my, my core strategy with the Union worked out because the Confederates just were not able to push through. The cavalry was able to hold. Now they lost up here in the north. They were not doing good. They were pushed back by the infantry a couple times. They lost some cavalry. Now they're shaken. And if that push continues, I see this cavalry falling. Uh, they're just not going to last. They're separated out. They're losing their cohesion. But we had been able to push up some more Union units up here to cover this road that would have led down to a nice selection of victory points over here. So I was able to get some Union uh, infantry units right here to block off that Confederate path while further reinforcements are able to kind of push their way up. So it was, it was a holding action, if you want to think of it that way. Down here where the main fighting was going on, the, the Confederates just were not able to get a push both in a, a previous turn that I played off camera, both sides had kind of taken a little bit of a breather. Uh, they had multiple shaken units on both sides. They took a breather, did some defense, got those units rallied, and then to push back up. But that was able to allow these Union um, cavalry here to push back down and hold this ridge, which has prevented this infantry from being able to push up. 
Had they been able to push up, they would have run into this artillery here uh, to kind of force them back. But four units of infantry were pushing their way down. And I was kind of planning on maybe either pushing them up this way and exploiting the gap or trying to flank this inf or this cavalry here. I hadn't decided which way I was gonna go with the, uh, the infantry just yet. Also, the Confederates had six units here, uh, two brigade groups getting ready to push up as well, but that is where the quandary really starts to come in on what you're playing and what you're doing. I'm gonna touch on that here in just a second. Down here to the south is where we saw a lot of stuff really starting to change for the Union. Again, they were just trying to slam in reinforcements as quick as possible. They had some that unfortunately were put on the board in the previous term, but they were not able to do anything. So they're still kind of holding, it has to do with that act, uh, uh, the way the units activate, which again, is kind of my key favorite part of all this. They were able to push up with some more artillery unit, uh, units that they're trying to push up, do something with, maybe get them on a ridge over here or push them outside of Gettysburg for extra defense. And then they also had some more infantry that were able to push up here from the main first corps they were going to be like a second line of defense again guarding that main route that comes in here into the side of gettysburg so even if the confederates were able to come into the north there would still be union units down here or if they were able to actually break through there was another line of defense so the cavalry even if they failed the Confederates were gonna run into some type of defensive unit. Now, just to show you guys, right here is a huge amount of units that were getting ready to push in on this turn, but not all of them because of the way the activation works, which is again, my, my key favorite uh, part of this game. But you can see there's multiple different uh, corps and brigades down here that uh, are getting added. This is a huge amount of Union units that get added during this turn. The Confederates don't get their huge boost until the following turn. We see 11th Corps got added this time. So their card, their core card, got added into it. So as it stands for this turn, there are three core cards left in the deck to be drawn and only a single core card for the Confederates. Now on the following turn, the Confederates would be adding an extra core card, but the Union forces definitely get a initial advantage uh, in this game, in this scenario, when it comes to the amount of units that they have on the board. And they really need to exploit that as much as possible. The thing of it is, is the Confederate forces are all kind of bunched up and attacking from the same direction, while the Union forces are coming in from multiple directions and they're very far away from where the battle's taking place. So they're having to decide what's more important, moving up or continuing their attack. I found this core card to be key though. This really kind of played it out and was excellent for the Union forces because they had this one that was specific to the cavalry and it allowed them to make decisions down here, moving units, going for as much movement as possible while they still went for those holding actions uh, with the cavalry, just trying to charge, trying to hold up the Confederates. Didn't matter if they lost the forces as long as the Confederates weren't able to exploit any gaps. Now to touch on the way I do it over here, and I found this really worked very, very well for me, is to stack all the units here. I touched on this briefly before, but whatever turn it is, just stack them right there on that turn. That way, you know, you see we're here on noon. So all the units that were there got added to the board and you see this huge amount of Confederate forces that are gonna to get to push in, but they don't get to push in until the next turn. Same thing when it comes to our displays, which I'm gonna to touch on here in just a sec. Have those cards ready to go, everything organized out. That way, as you go through each one of these hours, you can add those forces very quickly and you don't have to stop your game and go through all the time it takes to figure out what forces get added. You've already got them set here. You can just grab your stack, take it right to wherever they are supposed to go on the board. Now, for me, this is the key aspect that really takes the game to that next level. Now, I've got these division priority sheets folded over because for the scenario that I played, I didn't have to have the exact ones placed down, right? So like our 11th core card here, 
This one I've just got placed on the third core priority spot because it didn't matter. I didn't need to unfold the sheet for the extra space because these were the only ones I was going to have to worry about. I would recommend that as a space saving measure, depending on what scenario you're using. Obviously, if you're doing the campaign, if you're doing the full three days, then you're not going to be able to do, uh, to do that. You're going to have to have these folded out so you can have access to all the division priority spots. But for me, I really see this game start to shine when you're starting to have to pick between which ones of these division priorities you're putting in what spots. Now, a key example is that first core. Now, Reynolds was taken out, but we've got a replacement commander there. But for our first core at this section of the game, there are three division cards there. All right, so we started out with this one, then the green one got added, and then this blue one, or the blue and then the green, I forget which, but these got added to it. So at this point, we've got three of these cards and they have to be activated or they have to be put onto the priority sheet rather in the priority that you think is most important. And that's one of the most interesting aspects about it, because do you decide to stick with the forces that you've got stuck into the action by placing the red card? Or do you go for the ones that are coming in and you prioritize getting those reinforcements onto the board while hoping that your forces that are already engaged can hold out as long as possible. Now remember, you still have those event cards that can change the name of the game that you can also use for one-off activations where you can do a minimum movement or an attack using those events instead, using them as a default event. So you can use that to kind of make up for the fact that you're not going to activate the ones that are in division priority three or more than likely not going to activate them. But what you've got going on here is just that key choice. Which units are you going to prioritize? Now, for me on this turn, I had selected to go with green and blue as division priority one and two with red all the way in priority three, which means more than likely it wasn't going to get activated. The other green one had to do with the 11th core, and they're guaranteed to activate, or more than likely guaranteed, bad dice rolls put aside, when their core card gets activated. So bringing us back over here to the table to kind of think about it, when this card gets drawn, you see the best that you can hope for is to roll here so you get to activate priorities one and two, but that requires a six to be rolled, which isn't very likely to happen. So you have to make those hard choices. Who are you going to go with? What are you going to prioritize? You see all the red forces are already stuck in here. Now, a lot of these are the cavalry up front, but back here in the back where you've got the rest that have already been moved up, are you going to try to continue pushing with them or are you going to focus instead on getting those reinforcements into place? See, for the Union forces in this campaign, losing Reynolds is horrible. You want to try to hold on to him for as long as possible because he's an excellent commander. He's superior, which means on a roll of three to four, you're getting to activate division priorities one and two. That replacement commander does nowhere near as good and only does it on a six. So whether or not he's in the game still can make a huge swing when you start getting all these extra prior uh, core cards and division cards added to your player aids. Now, remember all those reinforcements that I showed you down south that were coming onto the board. When I was looking at it, I was thinking, OK, they're the priority. I got to try to get them up into it. The rest are as close enough. And I know the Confederate forces don't have enough attack and movement to really get by here. They're blocked off by the cavalry. They're not going to be able to get by them. And they're still a little bit back here holding holding on, right? The A couple of things, artillery, a little bit more cavalry, just in their way to hold them up so they can't just slam across over to here. So I've got at least another turn that I can hold on so I can focus on getting those reinforcements as far forward as possible. For the Confederates, I didn't feel like I had that advantage because their core card that they still have only goes to division priority one. So even though they now have that second division priority 
I would have to choose, am I going to prioritize moving these units up or continuing the attack here? And I thought for the Confederates, it's more important to continue this attack, especially since there's a weakened spot over here with the cavalry, try to push these guys up and exploit that, uh, that break in the line as much as possible so they can get forward and try to gain some of these victory control points. And that right there, that what I'm talking about, uh, where you're choosing to put those division cards, what priority, that I think is the key to this game. I think that's what really just takes it to this next level. Now, all of this stuff, right? All that we got going on, the combat, the odds, the trying to break cohesion, that's just the, the normal combat that goes on in any war game. Don't get me wrong. It's good. I really like the way the game plays out. But I think the, the division priority in choosing what you're going to focus on is really what brings this game to that next level. And not to mention only that, I think it brings the game to a next level when it comes to solitaire play as well. Because you're trying to focus on what those priorities are. And because you're having to choose your priorities and that the cards are drawn at random, now you know what car, uh, core cards are going to be in there, but you don't know when they're going to be drawn and you don't know what's going to be rolled on these, right? So that gives you some randomization in there. You don't know if you are going to be activating priority one, priority two, are you gonna get lucky? You know, what choices you're gonna be able to make during the game and then what order they're going to be made in. So that gives you all that randomization you need for solitaire play. So the only thing that you can do is focus on what's most important for each side at the moment and organize those division cards in that priority. So like I was saying, for the Union, they're in a good enough position that they can hold on for at least another turn so they can focus their efforts this round on trying to push up reinforcements into the engagement. The Confederates aren't as fortunate, they are in a position where they have to try to prioritize breaks in the line, so they have to organize their priority cards to still continue the push with the units that they have actively engaged, rather than can, uh, choosing instead to bring up those reinforcements. So maybe on some of their division of event cards, they hopefully get some movement with them. If they don't, maybe they use the default event instead to try to get some units on the board and at least get them a couple of hexes up. That was one of the things that I really just thrived and enjoyed with this game is that it started off small. There was a core card or two for each side, one division priority card you didn't have to worry about. And as the battle expanded and as the forces got stuck in with each other, more cards started getting added. More units started coming onto the board. The, the battle started to grow bigger and bigger and you had to start making some of those intricate decisions. Really because of the depth of the decisions that you have to make and what you've got going on with those division priorities, it allows the game to be played solitaire very, very easily, in my opinion, because you can focus when you're doing whatever side's turn when you draw that card, you're just focused on what's best for this side at the moment. You're not really, in my mind at least, because you know I'm always playing these solitaire, I'm not focused on thinking either side as my side unless that's the card that I've drawn because there are so many intricate deca uh, details going on that I can put all my focus onto just that and then turn and think of the other side. So I'm not kind of giving one side an advantage or another subconsciously. In a way, this game gives me a World at War 85 feel in the way that the cards are drawn and the way the game plays out. Nothing is guaranteed. It, the dice rolls, depending on how you roll on those core activation cards, right? Depending on what you get here, and then depending on what you roll on those division order cards, you might not even get to activate the units, right? That uncertainty gives the game just this huge amount of replay and just depth that I love. And it really does just remind me so much of World at War uh, 85 in the fact that for that game, you didn't know whether or not your unit card would even get drawn, 
right? So here we don't know whether or not a side might get activated depending on a bad roll. And that one, the card might not be drawn before the two end cards were drawn. So you weren't guaranteed an activation that round. So you always had to make the most of what you had in the moment. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't touch on this aspect of the game, but when it comes to the direct combat itself, the three die system, I think works really well because in so many other war games, you can just move your units around willy nilly. And this one, you can't because we saw during the course of this playthrough series, how much keeping units together with their brigades made a difference. That extra point of cohesion made a huge difference so many times, especially when I was playing it on film. For some reason, when I was playing off camera, the roles were high and the defensive roles were bad and all that stuff. And there was shaken results and depleted results and broken and all that crap happened. <laughs> when I was on camera, they did nothing but whiff. It makes, uh, makes sense thematically why you would want to keep your units together. It gives them that extra support. So it's built into the game. So you're seeing units activate and move around like they kind of would in the battle. They wouldn't have just gone off on their own, right? They would get slaughtered that way. It makes more sense for them to stay together so they can focus their advantages and their firepower against an enemy force. Same thing back and forth. So yeah, for me, this one really brings back that um, Thunder in the East feel. Big game on the board that I am sad to be having to take off the board because I want to keep playing it and I want to see how it all plays out. But it's been on my table, I think, now for over a month, which is very rare for me to dedicate that much time to a single game. But this one was worth it because it is absolutely phenomenal. The way it plays, the way the decisions play out, the components, the self, the, the map. The, the When it comes to the map, I would be remiss if I didn't say there are some quirks to it. Sometimes you have to kind of make a judgment call here or there uh, because it is hand-drawn, but it's gorgeous. It looks so good on the table that I can overlook any of those small little niggles about the fact that it is hand-drawn. So yeah, ultimately, if you're into Civil War games, you would be doing yourself a disservice if you did not give this game a try, hands down. If you don't like Civil War games, this one might be one that would get you into Civil War games. Uh, and the system itself is just worth trying. Now, I know they've had it in other games. I don't remember the games off the top of my head, but the battle system, the way this game plays out, has been used in some more of Herman Lutman's games. So definitely check him out if you like what you've seen thus far. Herman Lutman is the designer of this one. So you can look up other Her uh, Herman Lutman games and see if you like them. Obviously, he's got some uh, real good classics out there like Dawn of the Zeds. I will stay tuned and let you guys know if I hear specifically when they are going to be doing the second edition, make a quick little update video for you guys to let you know that, hey, if you missed it the first time, time to jump on and pick it up now. But unfortunately, that is going to be it for this one. I am going to have to be taking it down so I can put something else up. If you guys look here, I will think you will understand why I am Ready to take this one down because Enemy Action Karkov has been in my hands for a little while now and I need my big spot to put it on so I can do that game justice. So I do hope you guys enjoyed this playthrough series. Like I said, I really enjoyed it. Very fun game. Excellent components. Uh, just needs bigger player aids. Other than that, they did a damn sight perfect job when it comes to uh, a most fearful sacrifice. All right, that's going to be it for me. And stay tuned for some more awesome gameplay covering a few specialties that I have uh, prepared for you guys. All right, y'all take care. I'll catch you in the next one.